Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to our second IT Job Family Speaker event uh, this year in this lovely brand new auditorium. Today, we've got a wonderful uh, discussion um, with Eran Kinsbrunner from Perfecto Mobile, who's going to be talking through maturing your path towards continuous testing in DevOps. Um, I want to welcome everybody that's in the room, so thank you for, for attending today. Also, we have people on the webcast um, around the world that will be watching and also on the replay. And we also have a live VC link up with, with Raleigh. Um, so I hope people in Raleigh can hear me. Um, so, so Aaron's going to do a talk today on uh, maturing the path towards continuous testing in DevOps. Um, Eran is the author of two, two books, which is the um, Continuous Testing for DevOps, um, Continuous Testing for DevOps Professionals, and the Quality Digital Handbook. Um, and is also the Chief Evangelist at Perfecto Mobile. So I think it's fantastic to have uh, Eran here today as part of our second IT Job Family uh, Speaker Series event. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, and we will also, we'll also hand over to Raleigh as well for those questions. Um, at the end of the session, at the back, um, through those double doors, there's an ante room, and we will have tea and coffee served through there as well. Um, and as you noticed when you came in, you, you received a raffle ticket to, to win a free book um, that have been brought in today as well. Um, and one last thing I've been asked to um, remind people is that Eran has a space reserved from 4.30 this afternoon in pagination. So if you want to go along and have a drink, um, and also if you don't get a book right now, you'll certainly get a book then. So, <laughs> All right. so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Eran. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me in the back as well? Good. Uh, so uh, first, thank you, Michael, for inviting me. Uh, totally excited to do, and I think it's my first time delivering not a live session, but a live session, which is also being video conferenced to uh, the US and uh, also other places. So um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as uh, Michael introduced me, I'm uh, a chief evangelist and author uh, at Perfecto, almost 20 years now in the, the area of testing. Uh, started mostly for mobile, but then also looked at uh, healthcare industries, uh, hardware, software, um, Sun Microsystems, GE, you name it. And uh, for the last seven years, uh, I am dealing with uh, testing in the cloud, continuous testing in the cloud with Perfecto. Uh, and uh, trying to actually mature organizations that are struggling to be DevOps ready or mature DevOps. Um, I am all over social. I have my own blog called continuoustesting.blog. Uh, not that uh, creative, but <laughs> that's, that's my website. And uh, the book that uh, Michael mentioned, the latest one, Continuous Testing for DevOps Professionals, actually talks uh, about what is continuous testing, and I'm going to touch about the definition as I see it for continuous testing, but it's also divided into four categories. One uh, directed to mobile application testing, the other section is about web application testing, and the final section is about machine learning, AI, and the future of modern testing as we see it today. And I'm going to touch uh, in this session also, um, at least uh, the, the last part of my session will be around using machine learning and artificial intelligence in testing to actually boost your test automation coverage for mobile and web. Okay, And uh, I think uh, Michael mentioned it. Uh, it can be and sh maybe should be a, a, an open conversation. While I know that it's a very complex uh, uh, setup here, feel free to challenge me to, to ask any questions. I will also try and challenge you guys with, with at least one or two questions of my own. So uh, feel free to uh, be involved. So I will start my session today uh, defining what is continuous testing the way I see it. Uh, people are using and sometimes even abusing the term continuous testing, confusing it with agile testing. They are close, but in my mind, they are not really the same. Uh, so I'll define my uh, point of view on continuous testing. Then I will talk about uh, some of the challenges and disruptions that I see today that are blocking DevOps from being what it should be, a fast software release uh, vehicle uh, that involves 
all the, all the practitioners, both developers, testers, ops, POs, product management, everyone needs to be involved in one, uh, I'd say, synchronized method in releasing software. And it's not like that in many organizations that I meet, and I meet them on, on a daily basis. So uh, I'll try and uh, touch on some of the challenges, but also not just say that the world sucks. I'm actually going to talk about some things that I believe can be uh, implemented to solve some of these challenges. Uh, as mentioned, the, the last section of this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about machine learning, AI, and cordless testing, and how cordless testing, in my mind, uh, can complement the code uh, scripting uh, method in a DevOps reality, and actually give an opportunity to business testers, manual testers, to be part of this entire DevOps cycle. So, before, uh, and you can read from this slide, but uh, if anyone here in the audience can say what he thinks continuous testing mean, means. Don't be shy. <laughs> to do what? We are doing, we are testing continuously to do what? what what's the objective behind, behind continuously? And what, what is the feedback uh, aims to achieve? So making the fixes required, which can quickly get back out again. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's perfect. The only word that I'm missing here is risk. Okay? Basically, continuous testing that delivers fast feedback to the developers, to the organization, to the business, aims to identify quality associated risks that are tied to the latest code changes. Code changes can be bug fixes, can be new features, uh, full iteration, you name it, okay? So there are a lot of disruptions that are happening in the pipeline. If you continuously test them, you highlight, you identify uh, risks for quality. And continuous testing sometimes is being confused with high testing coverage, high test automation coverage. Coverage is a critical element in continuous testing, but it's not the most important thing. So uh, I visited this week uh, Lloyds Bank, and over there, they will say, okay, we need 100% test automation coverage. Everyone is challenging us to have 100% test automation coverage. And I think that's not what continuous testing means. That's not the end goal, okay? Because you don't have time, okay? When you release a, on a weekly basis, you can't run 100% of your test automation. You need to run 100% of what's relevant, okay? The right test cases obviously needs to be automated, but this, this is the scope, this is the coverage that you want to strive to run to identify the right risks. If you just blow your pipeline, you run through the Jenkins, the, through the CI, hundreds and hundreds of test cases, and you're not getting value out of the entire 100% test cases, you're wasting time, and you're actually adding more noise to the pipeline, which already exists. You don't need to make much more noise than it's already there, okay? So this is not new, and you know we are all in the financial industry. Uh, but I think what this slide, uh, slide means is that continuous testing today is harder than uh, we actually used to see. It's not because uh, testing is hard. The digital transformation is happening and continuously to evolve. Continuously evolves. We have seen uh, two days ago Apple releasing two new iPads. A month ago, uh, new foldable smartphones that were uh, launched by Samsung and uh, two other major uh, device manufacturers. What does foldable devices mean? Okay, You figured out how to test mobile native applications on a smartphone and on a tablet. Now you need one platform with maybe one application that can work on a smartphone, which is a hybrid device. Okay? And when you fold it, it's a smartphone. When you unfold it, it's a tablet. Okay. Do I need one application version? Maybe it's two application versions. How do I automate it? Okay, so, and most of our users are going to go with this device, okay? This device is not going to be cheap, but this is where the challenges are coming. This digital transformation doesn't stop, and even if you figure it out and you have good automation, it may break because a new smartphone comes up, a new form factor. Uh, we are hearing about the 5G that is becoming more, mostly adopted. Australia, I think, is the early adopter uh, in, the, in the world today that started distributing uh, 5G networks. It has meanings to your end users from an end user experience perspective, from quality perspective, performance, and so forth. 
uh, progressive web applications. Uh, anyone start, started hearing about progressive web? Yeah? Progressive web basically is a responsive web which has advanced capabilities like mobile. So actually, you're going to, let's say, creditsuisse.com, or if you want to go to a progressive web, go to ebay.com. ebay.com is a progressive web. When you go to that, you have an offline caching mechanism, which means every time you are offline, you can still interact with, the, with the, uh, the app from a mobile device. If you get notifications, push notifications uh, from the application from the website, you will see them on your mobile device, even when you're offline. This is the future, okay? So it, it was a responsive web up until a few months ago, now it's progressive, so you need to start testing more complex scenarios that involve both mobile and web capabilities. So that's what I mean by it's never been more complex because it continuously change, changes and evolves. Um, if I can ask you another question, what is today's, uh, your biggest testing challenge? You know, I know that there are many. One of the biggest things that you, you are coping with today, time, automation, what, what would you say? Test data up here. Excuse me? Test data was mentioned up here. Test data? Okay. Maintaining test data, making it more uh, accurate and relevant to where your production is. Okay. What else? Okay. How is, does it, it, it impact your testing? Or how does, does it complex, complicate your testing? Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, what's your name, please? Phil. Phil. Okay, Phil was talking about uh, testing infrastructure and infrastructure as code. When you add infrastructure as code, yeah. 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 Could be on private or public Good, good. So, I think we are all in agreement that testing. Uh, in the digital uh, space today is quite complicated. And when you're putting testing in uh, the lens of DevOps, DevOps means can, can mean continuous deployment, right? Someone wrote an, a line of code, immediately you want to be able to automate the process of building, validating, deploying it to production. And when we are dealing with infrastructure as code, testing and validating the artifacts coming from that, dealing with uh, progressive 5G, new phones, new websites, all these new technologies, you need to have a machine, an engine that runs constantly, okay? And again, it's not about the coverage, it's about the value and the fast feedback to identify risks associated with all the things that we are uh, producing. Unfortunately, and that's uh, from, uh, you know, interviewing and visiting uh, plenty of customers all across uh, you know, the verticals, financial, retail, media, and entertainment. I work with telcos like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. They all suffer from the same thing. They kind of figured out the DevOps uh, story. They know where they want to go. But uh, without really offending us as testers and practitioners, testing is the major thing that is slowing down the entire pipeline, the entire delivery cycle. And sometimes it's about skill set, sometimes it's about time, sometimes it's about the environment that is not available for them, the scale and the coverage that we are tasked to, to cover per each iteration. So there are a lot of, I would say, excuses why it's not working, but in reality, that's a huge problem to mature DevOps. And some of the outcomes that you can see here is that a lot of testing when it happens, it happens at the end of the cycle. And we talked about risk, right? You want to identify risk. We're actually creating risk when you're testing at the end of the cycle because you're not really testing everything. Some of the tests are not even being automated, so they either take too much time or when you're doing manual testing, it's a lot of error, uh, you know, human error, errors, sorry, uh, misunderstanding of the business flows. Manual testing has its own pitfalls. We know that. So uh, that's mostly what we see in today's reality. And as an average industry, what I'm seeing, I'm seeing about 50 to 60% test automation success in the mature organizations. 50 to 60% means about 40%, take, give or take, 
is done manually. Okay, 40% activities which are done manually in a pipeline in a DevOps reality, it's something that doesn't mean DevOps. It's not DevOps. Okay, it means that you are doing half DevOps basically uh, because you are neglecting few things. You are uh, avoiding testing some things which are important. Okay, you are taking huge risks here. Okay, so it's not that bad because we can. I think it's solvable. I think there is a path. That's the, the talk today. Maturing the path towards uh, achieving continuous testing. And um, before I talk about the path, I just want to give you, you know, two examples uh, which I see. You know, Perfect is a cloud vendor, so we have devices in the cloud serving major uh, customers. And in the cloud, these smartphones are uh, being used by enterprises like, like you guys. But they have the control, because it's a private cloud, they have the control over what they're testing. And I see a lot of times uh, test engineers, test automation engineers, and manual testers uh, not paying attention to details. You know, uh, this is uh, not a small detail. If you have a software update on your smartphone and you're not really take, obviously you want to test on the previous one as well, but if you're not making sure that you're catching up with the market, you're testing on the latest and greatest operating system, so again, it's another element of risk that you're taking. So it's about not just taking uh, the approach of automating and doing continuous testing, it's also dealing with the infrastructure that you are testing against, okay? Making sure that all the platforms that you're testing against are up to date, okay? You're running on the latest and greatest. If you have uh, things that are unique to devices, uh, on mobile you have three types of uh, logging into the app, right? You have the traditional user password on older devices, you have fingerprint on some devices, and you have face ID for newer devices. In some Android devices, you actually have face ID and fingerprint embedded in one. You need to take this under consideration when you are designing your test automation framework, your test automation scripts, so you actually do some kind of a branching between your test cases, so they are targeting the right device with the right capabilities. Okay? When you have one script that assumes that everything is user password or just fingerprint, and suddenly it needs to run on a fingerprint, sorry, on a face ID, uh, it will obviously break. That's your entry point to the app, and you cannot even uh, go into the device. Automation fails. Okay? It's as simple as that. So the DevOps process should, looks like, should look like that. Removing all the all the reds that we've seen in the past in the previous uh, slide of testing, uh, and to do so, you need to start small. You need to start uh, the right way. What we have seen in many places, and I've seen it also as a practitioner in my past when doing testing, management comes and says, "Okay, let's automate everything. Let's get high coverage. Let's put it in the build nightly cycle, and move on." Right? That's what they will say because they think big and they think about fast results. This is when things break. Okay? Starting actually small, making sure that you have a good foundation, a reusable foundation that you can scale up after you've seen that it works fine in the pipeline, in your CI, produces consistent results. Okay? Uh, we've seen too many times a test that runs inconsistently. Runs once it passes, once it fails, you lose trust. You lose trust in your test automation and you either stop using it or you continue use it, using it but wasting time on noise reduction rather than uh, identifying risks. The right approach is to embed into the continuous integration, into the pipeline, a small chunk of test cases, then build on top of them the coverage, and then increase coverage and run it continuously so you get consistent feedback. And most organizations actually follow the previous method, and that's one of the root causes for failures especially in the digital era when things changes. So one fail can actually, or one change can actually lead to a major uh, disaster. So in my mind, testing today in DevOps can become uh, a huge value to developers, both uh, to the product management, management and the product owners, uh, rather than be a liability. If the test cases, and that's when I started to talk about less coverage, more value, okay? When you focus on the test cases that brings you the highest value, the consistent one, that's when you're starting to improve, that's when you're starting to see that you are getting fast feedback. That's the, that's the goal of 
you know, DevOps, getting fast feedback, moving on to the net new, new iteration, the new innovation. Uh, so to do so, or to, to reach there, going to the previous statement that I said, start small and grow, building a stable test automation, create the script, maintain them. Maintenance can be a nightmare, especially when you're working with code, okay? Think about Selenium, Appium, uh, Espresso, XUI tests. These are all heavy coding uh, technologies, coding frameworks. So when you are developing using these frameworks and you're not thinking with the end in mind that you need to maintain them as things change, as object, objects are shifting, changes uh, are happening with screens and flows, it will take you ages to fix everything. So start small, make sure that you have the right foundation for a test automation, then build on top of that, and think about reusability, okay? Uh, we neglect and we see a lot of duplications in test automation because everyone is reinventing the wheel, okay? If you're working as part of a team and there are some reusable components that you can leverage as part of your test automation design, okay? Build them from the get-go and not uh, get uh, notified at the end that you have uh, X amount of frameworks, X amount of test cases that are uh, doing the same thing. That's when you go increase coverage, increase scalability. And when I'm talking about scalability, it's, it's not just about the platform coverage, like uh, more uh, Windows uh, permutations and more Samsung and iPhones. This is also a given, but also the time it takes you, okay? When you have a good and robust automation, you can run it at scale and let's say you run in parallel a thousand test cases, when you run it on 10 VMs, it will take you X amount of time. When you run it on 100 VMs, suddenly you shrink the time 10 times shorter. So that's when you, you know, reinvent your automation and mature it, okay? Make sense? Good. So, since this talk is about testing, and while we see a lot of cool logos that everyone is familiar with, uh, from development to building and uh, monitoring as well. And I'm sure that most of you guys are working with a, a set of or a mix of these tools. Uh, today is about you know, the testing piece, which in my mind is kind of broken. So to do so, I try to um, divide or define the continuous testing, the DevOps team, uh, into three personas. And Keep me honest if you think that there is a fourth one which I missed, but from what I've seen uh, up until today, we are dealing with three major personas. The business testers, sometimes they're called QA, QA testers, manual testers, they're in my mind under the bucket of business testers. These guys are very professional testers, they understand exploratory testing, they understand the business flows of the application end to end, they see the full picture, they think like the end users, like your customers, and this is a, a good thing. The only thing that they lack is the ability to write code, okay? It's not a big deal in some cases, but they're not writing in Java or JavaScript or Python or, or all the other uh, development languages. They can do a lot of manual testing or they can work with uh, some BDD tools, Gherkin, Cucumber, uh, which is fine, but they're not really developers. The second persona is the SDET, the test engineer, test automation engineer. And this is a developer in test being integrated, pulled into the feature teams, squads, well, whatever you call them, uh, as part of your DevOps uh, journey. These guys work with Selenium, with Appium, WebDriver.io. They sometimes can also build their own test automation frameworks in-house and uh, patch them and uh, you know, expand them as needed. These are highly skilled test engineers, but they lack, in my mind, you know, all the ISTQB, the testing language, testing lingo, and they're not always thinking with the end in mind, they're not thinking like your end users because they want to automate a flow. That's what they care about. They're not always thinking like your customers. This is when, uh, w when I was talking about the business testers. These are the guys that actually think like your customers. And then we have the software developers. Traditionally, people hear developers and doing testing. They say, okay, these guys are doing unit testing, right? API testing, which is good, which is fine in mature organization. Uh, we see them in some organization, we don't even see that these test cases are being developed by developers because developers have one slogan, just let me code. They want to move from one feature to the next. They don't want to waste their daily uh, cycles and activities 
uh, developing test automation. But in the DevOps reality, they are also part of a team that develop, develops and delivers value to your clients. So they need to be pulled also into the testing. And we have seen in, I say, most mature organizations, especially you know, in the mobile front, these guys are taking responsibility of using Espresso and XUI test. Uh, because these frameworks are actually built in and bundled into their IDEs. So it's a very easy um, jump for them to work and develop XUI tests because it's from Xcode, they know Xcode, it's in their zone, if you like, so it's uh, straightforward. Uh, so we see that as well, but again, they're not really thinking about the full end-to-end -end cycles, they're looking at their own feature and functionality. So that's, in my mind, that's the, the landscape that uh, in, should take care of quality, okay? should own quality. There is the testing management, which owns quality responsibility, but these are the different practitioners that are doing test automation development, test man manual test execution, and so forth. Any, any, any persona that I think you think I missed? Good. Unfortunately, you know, these personas, when you divide them, into a cycle, into a pipeline, you know, and that's in my mind the unoptimized model. Um, these guys, the business testers, are a huge question mark because they don't fit the cycle. Okay, why they don't fit the cycle? Because they are tasked with a lot of manual activities. Okay, which is either late in the cycle. Okay, until the time they get access to the features and the new implemented code. It's too late, okay? So it's something they're not even included in the conversations. And th this is a big miss. This in my mind, this is the 30% test automation coverage that we are missing in the cycle, in a very continuous testing mature model. Because these guys, the SDETs and the developers, maybe they're doing more than unit testing and uh, build acceptance testing. Maybe they're doing some non-functional security APIs, it's fine, uh, even later in the cycle. But these guys own in a success rate between 50 to 60 percent of the test automation that we need to uh, achieve. This is not good enough. Okay? We are missing here, I think the market is missing here a huge opportunity by not leveraging these smart people that can actually complement what's, what's missing and actually bring the voice of the customer to the table. I think the voice of the customer is often left unheard because skill set and time prevents it. Would you agree? You can say that you don't, it's, it's okay. Okay, so in my mind, this is how an optimized model in continuous testing in DevOps uh, should and can look like. Think about the, the high skilled guys, the test engineers and the developers. They can continue and they should continue doing code based activities. Selenium, Appium, Espresso, XUI test, API testing, SOAP UI, throw everything that has code in it into this bucket. You will get to this 50-60%, it's, it's all good. Put these business testers in, in the loop, include them in the loop, make sure that all the flaky and common test failures that you are seeing, the inconsistent results that you are seeing, are being bucketized, being uh, identified, and placed under this guy's ownership responsibility. Okay, that's the first step. Once you identify that, Start looking based on the skill set and the fitness to the platform, whether, whether it's web or mobile, if these guys can start working with Cucumber, or BDD, there is Selenium IDE now that's uh, out there, cordless testing. There is our solution, Perfecto Cordless, which is uh, available for web, okay? And put this 30% into action. Again, like continuous testing, don't start and, okay, I want to automate uh, in this bucket, all the 30% cases that are either manual or uh, not executed at all. Start with the 5% of these test cases. Do a small win, make sure that they have confidence, make sure that these test cases are now part of the CI, part of the cycle that these guys are owning, okay? And start having this marriage running for like a few days, few nights, make sure that you're getting good value out of them. And if it works, you're not, it won't work in all cases, because it depends on uh, technology, the fitness to the process, the timeline, the skill set that these engineers have, uh, et cetera. But 
In my mind, this is a huge opportunity to start closing the gap in test automation that this industry, if you read any uh, report, either from Gartner, the qual World Quality Report that is coming out every year, says the same thing over and over again. 50% test automation, 60% test automation. I think that the organization are kind of sick and tired of hearing this number, and they want to break this barrier of 85, 90% test automation. And I think this is, in my mind, the only way that I could find up until today that can break this barrier, because there is a lot of flakiness by definition in testing, okay? Objects are changing, the platforms are changing, uh, new features, time constraints, and, and you know, the people themselves, us, okay? We don't have the will, especially developers, to do so many testing, okay? They want to move to new features. So with that in mind, this is the only way that is available today. Maybe in five, 10 years from today, we'll think about something else, and I actually can tell you what's going to happen, or my prediction is in what's going to happen in the next couple of years. And it, by the way, is in my mind going to grow this bucket, maybe taking more like 60% of the test automation, because it will be so AI machine learning driven that you will only need to point uh, an engine, a tool, to a website, and based on a lot of artifacts that the engine knows how to process, it will actually automate the entire end-to-end -end scenario for you, and it's not that far away, okay? If I had my laptop connected, I could have shown you a live demo of your website, by the way, I played with it last night, uh, running end-to-end -end recording of an exploratory test on Credit Suisse, you know, and it's getting there, okay? So in my mind, we are, this is kind of the evolution of continuous testing, uh, putting all the personas, all the practitioners on the same page. And oh, oh, by the way, manual testing is not going away, never. <laughs> we do have specific cases that we do want to execute manually, but these things won't uh, be required on a nightly basis, okay? This is not part of your CI in any case. So you can identify these cases that you run each iteration in a given time slot that doesn't disrupt or doesn't uh, you know, interfere with the overall release cadence. So let's double click, if you like, on what is cordless testing, what is the modern cordless, cordless testing as I see it, going back to the opportunity for the business testers, okay? And cordless testing isn't new. We used to have HP, QTP, UFT, uh, Tricentis of the world uh, that was recording and playbacking uh, a lot of test cases from the UI. But what was the problem with these kind of test cases and tools? They were all static tests, okay? Immediately as something changed, changed on the app, an object, you are done, okay? You need to go back, re-record it, maintain it. It's a nightmare and obviously it doesn't fit the model of continuous testing, okay? So this, this was the, the old modern, sorry, the old uh, kind of tools. The modern tools that we see today in cordless are now featured with machine learning and AI algorithms and engines that can identify all the objects as soon as they see the screen. It only needs to see your website. It can read the entire DOM, all the objects, the CSS, the XPath, whatever the developers is putting, is a, it's available for the engine to work on. The only thing that is missing is the full automation thing. That's the deep learning, the deep uh, AI algorithms that can run end-to-end -end scripting for you. So we are still requiring with Cordless today the business tester. And why? Because this record and playback is mostly uh, exploratory. Who knows to do the best exploratory testing? The business tester. They see the end-to-end -end scenarios. They know how to get from A to B to Z. Wh wh whenever and whatever changes that are made to the user stories, these guys understand, okay? This is why they are best positioned to take uh, this cordless to the next level and actually create uh, zero maintenance test automation that can fit into the CI. These tools, this uh, wave of tools that we are seeing, uh, they, they, they are tools like test.ai and Apply tools, uh, our own uh, newly developed solution as well, uh, that are coming to the market, they all have the same standard functionalities, okay? Data-driven testing, conditions, visual assertions, and other validations. They are all part of the same, you know, solution, but 
uh, the thing that they have, again, other than the ML and AI capabilities, is the ability to connect to the CI or to the cloud. And we know that all of the organizations today are working with cloud solutions, with third party uh, tools, integrating with other uh, solutions like databases and stuff, uh, and analytics tools. So the connectivity to CI and other tools, this is something new that we see in the cordless era that can actually support today's needs, which wasn't, weren't available in the past. And I think the most important thing here is that these test cases are complementing the code-based testing, the Appium and the Selenium of the world. So this is not coming to take place or take the place of the coding uh, activities that are happening, but rather complement what's happening today towards a higher degree of test automation. With that in mind, and that's kind of marching towards the future of testing, uh, you, we need to keep in mind that when you're trying to combine two processes, which are by definition different, uh, cordless and code-based uh, testing, test development, uh, you need to uh, uh, be alerted that there are major differences. Okay? These differences are all over the place from a test creation and authoring perspective, skill set, time it takes to execute, so you need to actually synchronize when you're moving to things like cordless and machine learning tools, you need to synchronize because these tools will create scripts. It took me less than 10 minutes yesterday to do an exploratory flow on creditswiss.com. Um, to write it, the exact same scenario in Java using Selenium on the desktop web would have take, taken me, if I'm a very expert developer, two hours, in some cases, if it's very complicated, can be four hours, okay? So it's obviously it requires a lot of high skill set in Java, but the flow itself, the process itself is longer. So we need to think if we're going to adopt such model in continuous testing, and again, that's in my mind the future of testing, uh, how do we synchronize the processes towards having one CI, one pipeline running all the test cases, both from the Selenium part and the cordless part, uh, delivering the fast feedback uh, at the same time. And there are many other uh, differences. I won't go into each and every uh, bullet here, but uh, the UI is obviously different. The, con the source control management with Selenium and Appium obviously works with Git or other tools. Here you're working with a different UI. Okay, so there are other differences. The maintenance is much uh, greater on the code-based testing compared to the cordless. Um, and if you look at you know, tool maturity and documentation, obviously the selenium of the world is highly documented. You have plenty of code samples in Git and other uh, repositories. Um, there aren't, aren't many best practices, other than the one that I'm, I'm trying to develop these days, uh, to cordless testing and how they can actually fit uh, the DevOps cycle. So uh, there is a level of maturity gap between these two tools and also what they can accomplish. Obviously, when you're doing open source testing, you can do more API testing, security, and uh, non-functional testing. When you're doing cordless testing, it's mostly focused on the UI, on the end-to-end -end flow, exploratory testing. So it's a different type of testing that you're doing. But still, it's a lot of testing that is done today manually or not even at all. OK? So that's a nice summary slide for the previous point. No one competes here. It's not a competition between one approach to the, to the other. It's actually a joint thing, bringing these personas together toward a more, more efficient continuous testing flow, taking codeless, code-based business testers, SDET, and developers working together towards a very uh, high degree of test automation with as little maintenance as you can think, because you already removed all the flakiness from the code and moved it to cordless. So that's how it all connects. I put here some, uh, you know, f just few uh, best practices uh, on how to do, or if you are thinking about this uh, path towards cordless plus code based uh, with your continuous testing and it's the, uh, web and mobile, it doesn't matter. Identify the manual and flaky test cases that can feed these business testers, okay? see from your history, okay, which exploratory testing uh, were able to find from a value perspective the highest degree of defects, 
in production as part of your cycle, doesn't matter. Make sure that you have this bucket of test cases as candidates uh, for uh, the cordless approach. Once you have them, okay, start the small thing, like I mentioned in the beginning, and put tagging. Okay? Make sure that you identify the test cases so when they are running as part of the CI and you're getting the feedback, you know where it's coming from. It's coming from Selenium, it's coming from cordless, it's coming from, I don't know, other tools that you are using. It's, it's important just because to, if you want to grade the valu most valuable test cases and you want to prioritize, you will know where to start and how to filter uh, your test execution pipeline. The smarting is already bundled in the ma machine learning and the AI, so you get it as, as free if you like. Uh, obviously, it needs and it can connect to your CI, but again, one, only once it's mature, you don't want to get noise back to your CI after you excluded it. So make sure that only when it's stable enough, you put it back in the CI, but you will see a boost in your productivity, in your test automation coverage, and obviously, with the, your time to market, the release time will obviously uh, go down. And like any other uh, maintenance, uh, you're doing maintenance to your car every six months, you're doing uh, refactoring to your test automation code whenever you, you need to do it. Also, when you're dealing with cordless, you need to identify maintenance points because even though maybe objects are not the issue anymore with cordless, flows, new, new changes to, to the UI and so forth may interfere or cause some flakiness in your cordless. So also keep that in mind. And I think this will be like the five basic things to start with. Obviously, there are much more documentation and other considerations. But if you are starting with that as a beginning, uh, I think it can be a, new, a nice uh, breakthrough for a test automation coverage. So before I move to you know a, a word about uh, what we are doing and uh, some other pieces on co of continuous testing uh, and maybe a case study of uh, one of uh, uh, our customers, USAA, how they select their uh, DevOps strategy. Uh, any questions so far or comments? Here in the US, any questions from the US? Sure, it's a good question. So the question was uh, the, the ratio between cordless and code-based, or if there is a recommendation. So uh, if assuming you have a, about 30 to 40 percent of your test cases that are manual, and there are the candidates to move to cordless, um, I think that you know this is kind of where I would uh, start with. Uh, but let's say if you have much lower test automation success, because 60% is the highest that I've seen so far, especially when I'm dealing with uh, digital, mobile, and web, um, I would sometimes see 40%. So you have actually a bucket of 60%. Uh, so again, I would say, and I hate to say depends, but it really depends on the maturity and the success that you have today uh, as part of your automation. Uh, in some cases, you don't have a good test automation framework. You don't have the developers taking part or uh, part of the load of doing testing. So I think it brings just a larger opportunity for cordless to take more coverage because eventually you will see cordless as it matures taking more and more pieces of coverage from your test automation uh, pipeline. So um, again, it's not really a uh, black and white here. It depends on the quality and the application and the skill set. Uh, but And by the way, if you have a new project starting today and it's not a legacy thing, Maybe start 50-50, okay? Say, okay, I'm uh, mixing my risk because testing is a risk. Test automation in general is a huge risk because you, need, you develop it and it's not a one and done. You, you develop it and you continuously need to maintain it. Otherwise, you're not getting the value out of it. So putting a 50-50 on a new project is not such a huge risk to take. It actually makes sense to me. Excellent. So um, I think that when you're looking at cordless and code-based, okay, that's why actually, actually also uh, to avoid duplication, you need to actually tag, put some tags uh, in your test automation. Okay, this is cordless by definition, and can be cordless underscore login, cordless underscore the business flow that you are trying to automate. And uh, think about it, when you're doing cordless, you're recording and playbacking the test cases. So it's more like an exploratory flow, end-to-end -end flow, uh, rather than you know, just testing uh, something which is more structured 
uh, scenario that you're doing in Selenium or in, uh, in Java in general. Uh, but in my mind, the best approach, regardless if you're doing exploratory or structured test automation development, use tags, put a tag cordless versus not cordless with a descriptive name, so you know that you know it's checked, okay? You're not going to go back to it. And if it's a, a different in web and in mobile, actually also put the target up uh, in the name as well. Uh, otherwise, it will get lost. I'm dealing with customers who are executing uh, hundreds and thousands of test cases overnight. If they're not putting or using tagging in JUnit or even cordless, cordless supports tagging as well. It's very hard to filter, slice and dice data and analyze the results. So uh, it needs to be kind of proactive. The bottom line it needs to be proactive as part of your test design. Uh, so you know that you're not duplicating, but also you can filter back and analyze when something is failing. Eventually, down the line, let's say one year, one and a half year, it goes down. The activity on the project, but still, there are some minor modifications or certain enhancements which is needed. So, are we not creating dependency on two type of skill sets? One, which is a codeless script, and second, which is uh, pretty much like based on the coding. So, how do we handle the maintenance? Because, let's say, a person, a project cannot afford when when they go in the lean period of time, yeah. they cannot have people with both the skill sets. So essentially, then it becomes my maintenance nightmare. Either you maintain the codeless script or you maintain the with code script. So how do you handle in the in the examples that you have or, or the project that you have already built? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a great question. Uh, just repeat the high level of, of it. Uh, talking about test maintenance between the two different approaches of code and codeless as the project evolves, you know, uh, because as uh, you mentioned, it requires two different skill set to uh, maintain two different test types. So since cordless is kind of a new uh, beast in, in, the, in the market, but one that, uh, one that can actually add more value that was missing, uh, I don't think that today there is a very good process in place that says, okay, every week, every month, I'm putting some checkpoints, check marks, uh, to do refactoring of code versus cordless, okay? So I think it, uh, goes back to your process, okay? I, I don't know what's the process today of uh, updating your Selenium scripts, okay? Or maintaining your Selenium scripts. I think that, um, as mentioned, it's not a structured uh, methodology yet, but um, in my mind, you know, if you are executing the scripts, let's just take the code, the Selenium. If these scripts are executing, executed nightly, it means that they're A, adding value, B, they're still relevant, Okay, so by definition, if something is wrong there, you, will, you don't need to maintain them. You will get the feedback that something is broken and you will go back, exclude them from the CI, fix them and throw them back. Okay, that's not the, the case that you're talking about. You're talking about test cases that are probably not being executed daily. Okay, that's when you start to think, okay, do I still need to maintain them? Do I need to uh, have these checkpoints um, or not? And I think that depends on, okay, what's your next release? of, of uh, software that you're going to use them, okay? If you have this visibility into the roadmap and you know when these test cases, because that, again, this case is mostly when you're not running them nightly. You know the, the roadmap, you know when is the next iteration of software, put, I don't know, a month or two months beforehand uh, to re-execute them, plan them into a se separate CI if you like, uh, against the oldest version or latest version that you have and try to identify and uh, uh, pull, pull up all the issues that you might have, okay? So I think to summarize this, uh, this answer, you have two methods here, one with ongoing tests that are always executed and the ones that are you know, sitting and waiting for a new software iteration. And for that, you need to have good visibility into the roadmap so you can plan these maintenance points because you wouldn't just execute them and waste time if you don't see a, a six month release coming up. Okay, it would just be a waste of your time. Okay, sure. Any more questions here in the US? Good. Okay. 
I had something. OK. So um, I just put something that is specifically to Perfecto uh, from a color perspective, because uh, again, it's not a, a marketing slide. It's just the point of view that was uh, in front of uh, the product management at Perfecto before they decided to move uh, and add coders because Perfecto supported Selenium, Appium, all the code-based frameworks uh, for the last uh, couple of years. But uh, adding this uh, cordless thing came mostly because of the effort of maintaining and uh, adding reliability to the test cases uh, and also the setting up. Okay, setting up a Selenium grid with uh, maintaining the Java and the code and everything takes a lot of time. So trying to address the zero setup, the easy ramp up to learn and automate things uh, to record with a high reliability of object identification. Uh, all the things that you are seeing here on the screen, the fitness to the process, to the CI, and so forth, running in the cloud, these are some of the considerations that uh, led Perfecto to move to that uh, method of cordless. And that, in my mind, I think, is a get good and great match and complementary thing to the code activities that are being happening or used uh, in the market today. So, still going to the different personas. You have the QA, you have the dev. Uh, each have uh, its own, I'd say, pain uh, throughout the pipeline. Uh, but at the end of the day, each persona cares mostly about different things. And if you look at the key pillars in DevOps and continuous testing, uh, and I will just focus here on continuous testing because that's the session. Uh, it's the four words that you see on the left. It's creation, execution, lab, and analysis. When you figured out these four things and you have them in a very well-managed and maintained way across the different personas, you are in a good place to move and mature your DevOps. And there is something we are calling the DevOps-friendly zone. Okay? The DevOps-friendly zone means that when you have the ability to create scripts that are reliable and can run on a daily basis, and the developers can execute at scale to reduce the time for feedback in a reliable lab that is always up to date and not have this software updates pop up that some, someone is ignoring. And it doesn't take you, I spoke with a customer who is spending 72 hours to uh, just analyze his regression suite. He's executing 1,000 test cases, uh, sometimes uh, like on a weekly basis. Spending 72 hours per each iteration just to analyze a report is time that you don't have, okay? Especially when you're moving that fast or you want to move that fast. So uh, analysis is also, and that's when, uh, when we are going back to these tagging activities, uh, making sure that we know which result and which test is delivering which value so you can filter, slice, and dice, and uh, move faster with root cause analysis and bug fixing as well. So I, I would say these are the four pillars for good continuous testing in DevOps. And when you, you match the technology and the process uh, to the personas, and we know that we are three personas now, I think you are in a good way. That's the path in my mind towards continuous testing in DevOps. I will skip uh, some of these benefits because I think they all make sense. I, I do want to give you, and uh, there are more in, inside the book, but uh, I get often asked, okay, so how do you measure? How do you know that you are in a good place? Okay? So there are just few things, and uh, this is not a measurement to blame or to find someone which is guilty. It's all uh, to actually continuously improve what we are trying to accomplish. Okay? Release software with confidence, identifying risk fast, and releasing fast. So how is the level of flakiness that you see today in your testing? How many builds are broken? The mean time to find and resolve issues. These are just a few examples that I'm seeing uh, all across the board uh, by many enterprises, many organizations that are marching towards DevOps. A number of user stories implemented per iteration. Why it's important? You know, okay, are you able to move fast enough or you have productivity issues that might be uh, inside your development chain or your testing activities? So these are just few broken builds based, with, based or filtered by categories. What caused the broken builds in your CI? Which branch is mostly flaky, if you, if you like, and these kind of things. So the bunch of measures 
here that I think that if you want and if you are serious in marching towards DevOps, you need to have a set of metrics. And I'm sure that you guys are using some metrics. Uh, I hope that you're using some, some metrics uh, in your productivity. Uh, but you need to continuously use them and measure so you can improve, not just to find someone who is guilty, because that's not uh, what we're trying to do here. So at the end of the day, with that, I will conclude the session. Um, you need to be, to be successful in continuous testing in DevOps. I mentioned in the previous slides what you want to have. But at the end of the day, we are all human. We are all people, uh, taking aside the machine learning and AI, which is less human, trying to be. Uh, so it's a marriage of people, process, and technology. Everyone had these three, uh, I'd say, uh, magic words. But this is the reality. If you are not able to match your people, the three personas that I mentioned earlier, to the right processes of software development and releases, you know, by giving them the right tools to be successful, eventually you will fail. Okay? It's a cultural thing, it's a process thing, and of course technology can support it, but this is kind of a state of mind that uh, we need to keep in mind to be successful, and of course, taking measures and making sure that we are on the right track every day, every path, every stage that we are marching forward uh, is uh, required. With that, I will conclude. I do have an, uh, everyone that is here and online and on video conference will get the full slides. So I have a few more examples of how USAA kind of selects the tools, but it's close to what I've described. You know, they look at the tools landscape as a freeway. You can have tall roads which you need to pay. Let's, these are the commercial tools. They are tools which are open source, but bringing them all together that match, so they can match people, process, and technology, that's what they believe is the right approach for their business. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you guys. I know that we exceeded a few moments, right? But uh, if you have any other questions or more questions, I'm here and happy to address them.